Namaste. Namaste everyone. Welcome to second PC physics class. So we were in nuclear physics, right? Now we had stopped in uh, uh, binding energy curve. Even though we call it as binding energy curve. Namaste. Namaste everyone. Hope you are doing well. Even though we are calling it as binding energy curve, it is actually binding energy per nucleon. So we have seen that when nucleus is formed, some amount of mass, a little bit of mass, is lost and that mass is converted into energy while forming the nucleus. So energy required to form the nucleus starting from individual protons and neutrons that is called binding energy or energy required to break a nucleus is called binding energy into individual protons and neutrons and energy equivalent of mass defect is also called uh, binding energy. Remember mass defect itself is not called binding energy because mass defect is mass. It can be expressed in either kg or atomic mass unit. Uh, its energy equivalent is uh, binding energy. So what is mass defect? Mass defect is the Z into mass of protons plus A minus Z into mass of neutrons. This is what is expected mass of uh, uh, nucleus. But what happens is uh, mass of the nucleus is not uh, of this much uh, and it will have little bit of less mass because uh, uh, some mass is lost in the form of energy. So this difference is called mass defect. So if you convert this difference uh, into energy, that gives the binding energy. So delta m, if it is in kg, then delta m c squared. If this is in kg or uh, gram or something else. Suppose if you want to try to put the mass in uh, atomic mass unit, what you can do? So 1 u is uh, how much? 1.67 into 10 to the power uh, minus 27 kg. This is the mass of uh, uh, 1 uh, uh, u uh, in kgs and it yields to, so 1 u is equivalent to 931.5 million electron volt of energy in MeV if you want to write. So 1 atomic mass unit yields 931.5 million electron volt of energy. Suppose you lose 10 u, then it is 10 times this much. That's what you can do. So direct multiplication is possible. Okay, now if you calculate the total binding energy of any nucleus, that doesn't give you the exact uh, uh, idea of the stability of the nucleus or the strength of the nucleus. If the nucleus has to be tested for its uh, stability or its uh, strength, you will have to check binding energy per nucleon. So what is binding energy per nucleon? The total binding energy per mass number. How many people will enjoy that binding energy inside the nucleus? That counts. So binding energy per nucleon is called specific binding energy and that has to be calculated. So a nucleus may have high binding energy, for example uranium. uranium. Uranium has more binding energy, but there are many, many protons and neutrons inside the nuclear, 235 protons and neutrons. Mass number is 235 or 238, uh, it's isotopes. And uh, so per nucleon, whatever the energy available is much, much less. So it is not stable. So that is what you have to calculate. So if you draw a graph of, these are all the things which have come across in the previous class. So if you gra draw a graph of, Binding energy per nucleon, this is the area where you usually go wrong. You do everything proper in the examination, but you forget to write binding energy per nucleon here. You simply write binding energy. That is uh, uh, very much wrong and you will lose all the marks. Binding energy per nucleon and mass number. Okay. Yeah, and some, sometimes you write it as atomic number. That is also wrong. So a graph of binding energy per nucleon versus mass number, a graph will be obtained like this. You will have a sudden hike in the binding energy per nucleon and again another hike and another hike like this. And then a high value of binding energy per nucleon and then decrease like this. This is the binding energy per nucleon curve versus mass number. Very important curve because this gave answer to many, many questions in the nature which were unanswered. Uh, the highest binding energy lies for 8.75 million electron volt and this is in million electron volt, I don't write the unit here, 8.75 and that lies for iron, iron is the strongest element, even calcium is strong and that because the specific binding energy or binding energy per nucleon for iron or calcium is uh, uh, very high, 
that is the highest one. And here are some spikes which say that binding energy per nucleon is uh, uh, not varying smoothly uh, with the neighbors. Suppose the binding energy of uh, um, uh, lithium is something, then uh, um, beryllium will not be uh, the same as uh, uh, its uh, neighbor lithium. So there will be much difference. There is a high sudden increase and decrease. So this is uh, um, lithium, nitrogen, and uh, oxygen. So like this. So it should move forward, oxygen. And what about this one? Uh, helium, carbon, oxygen. This is oxygen 16. This is another isotope of oxygen. So this is the value which is very less value for uh, oxygen compared to oxygen 16. And compared to nitrogen, the uh, value of our carbon is very high. Nitrogen will have this value, whereas carbon will have high value. See, the sudden increase and decrease in the uh, specific binding energy or binding energy per nucleon here in this range. Uh, but such spikes are not found uh, anywhere else except here. So, this is one range and uh, what about here? See, uranium, say 234, then, uh, okay, uranium 235, something like this. It is not stable. Its binding energy per nucleon is less. So, what are the features of the binding energy curve? Once you draw all the binding energy per nucleon for different elements versus mass number, you get a curve like this. So, what is the conclusion of this curve? Very simple. The curve says that for elements which have mass number very less, for example, 10, below 10, the elements lying below 10, they have very, very less specific binding energy, which says that they are very, very unstable. And their nuclei is very not, uh, not very strong. So, elements having very less mass number below 10 are unstable. Their binding energy per nucleon is very less. Elements having mass number very high, say greater than 170. So, let us have a range between 30 and 170. Mass number between 30 and 170. Elements having mass number between 30 and 170 have less binding energy per nucleon. Uh, sorry, no, they have high binding energy per nucleon. Elements lying away from this or outside this range have less binding energy per nucleon. So elements having mass number between 30 and 170 have binding energy per nucleon a little bit very high. So greater than some uh, 7.5 million electron volt. And the highest lies for 8.75 million electron volt. That is what you call iron. So binding energy per nucleon for elements lying between 30 and 170 is very fairly high and it is uh, more than 7.5 million electron volt. This one. So here if it is 30 and if it is 170 somewhere here, for them it is uh, greater than 7.5 million electron volt. And binding energy per nucleon is uh, very high for elements, uh, for very high for iron, uh, calcium, etc., lying uh, approximately at uh, 8.75 um, um, million electron volt. And uh, binding energy for elements uh, having high mass number is also less, low mass number is also less. So why this is so? The reason for this, uh, the reason for the nuclear processes occurring in the nature, like fission, one, nuclear fusion, and all these, why this occurs in nature? That answer for all these questions was given in this graph. How? Why does fission occur? Why heavy, heavy elements, uh, uh, when they are bombarded with neutrons, split into two? So, breaking up of a heavy nuclei, thereby forming two uh, daughter nuclei which are stable. Heavy nuclei is unstable and the daughter nuclei is very stable. Why this happens in nature? Heavy nuclei which have high mass number, they are unstable. Reason is, they have many protons inside. The repulsive force between the protons will become a little bit predominant and the nuclear, uh, the binding energy will be little, uh, uh, binding energy per nucleon will be less. So elements having very high mass number are unstable. How do they become stable in nature? By splitting themselves into two lighter nuclei and which have lesser mass number and they come here. For example, uranium splits into two uh, elements like barium and krypton, for example, need not be always barium and krypton. Suppose uranium splits into barium and krypton. Barium and krypton are stable. So, fission is a process where a heavy unstable nuclei split into two lighter nuclei of comparable masses and these lighter nuclei will be more stable. 
and the uh, proper explanation for why fission occurs in nature is given here. So once they are uh, lighter nuclei with the lesser mass number, they come under this category here and their uh, uh, this uh, binding energy per nucleon will be high. One reason. Second one. Why lighter, what, what happens to the very, very, uh, sorry, elements having very less mass number, what happens to them? Elements having very less mass number, they combine together to form a heavier nucleus. That is what you call fusion. Fusion is a process where lighter nuclei combine together to form a heavier nucleus. So once they become heavier, suppose for example hydrogen and hydrogen combine together from deuterium, deuterium nuclei combine together to form helium and then they become stronger. So elements having very less mass number are unstable, uh, their nuclei is unstable uh, um, and uh, they have less binding energy per nucleon. In nature what happens is they combine together and they become a heavier nuclei and uh, that lies here again. So their binding energy per nucleon will be more. So fusion gives a stable nuclei. Fission gives a stable nuclei. Heavy elements undergo fission and become stable. Lighter nuclei combine together and become stable. And we have a liquid, uh, so we have a model called liquid drop model which uh, explains uh, all these things. But uh, a liquid drop model was not successful in explaining all the nuclear phenomena. Whatever is happening in nucleus, everything is not explained in liquid drop model. So, but some, to sum up why fission and fission occurs, uh, is explained in liquid drops. Suppose you have small liquid drops, very very small liquid drops, they are unstable. They combine together to form a bigger drop. Suppose the drop is too much bigger, it splits into smaller drops so that it becomes stable. So everything is explained in the uh, uh, graph itself. So graph itself is self-explanatory and uh, you, give, you can give all the answers to the questions of fission and fusion. So you may be asked to write the features of uh, um, this uh, binding energy curve. So what is binding energy per, uh, per or specific binding energy? Uh, draw the specific binding energy curve and explain the features. So binding energy per nucleon is called specific binding energy and uh, the graph is like this and, which, uh, and this graph clearly indicates that uh, the first point elements having less mass number are uh, um, unstable and their binding energy per nucleon is less and elements having high mass number are uh, again unstable they have less specific binding energy here and elements having uh, mass number between 30 and 170 are very stable they have binding energy per nucleon greater than 7.5 million electron volt and element uh, like ion will have very high specific binding energy which is very strong in nature and uh, the reason for fission is given in the graph that elements having uh, high binding energy uh, high specific binding energy like uranium, they split into two and uh, uh, become stable and they come under this uh, group here and elements having very less mass number are unstable. They combine together, they undergo fusion and they become stable. So everything is explained. So very important curve. Okay, now we will uh, see what is fission. Okay, so fission is a process that is happening in nature where heavy nucleus breaks up into two lighter nuclei and those two lighter nuclei will be stable and their masses will be comparable, comparable mass uh, products we will get and uh, best example is uranium. Suppose you take uranium 235, 92 atomic number, mass number 235. Its nucleus is not stable, it is not very strong, its binding energy per nucleon is very less but binding energy total will be more. But binding energy per nuclear, when you divide it by 235, you will get uh, per nucleon value very, very less. So it is unstable. Now we will make it more unstable by putting one more neutron into the uh, nucleus. So uh, take a high uh, uh, kinetic energy neutron and uh, make it, our, we call, use a word called bombarding. Bombarding means a fast moving neutron is made to hit the nu nucleus. When it hits one nucleus of uranium, you get one more neutron inside the nucleus. So when a fast moving neutron is made to hit the uranium nucleus, it enters into the uranium nucleus. Now the new element formed is 236, right? It is balanced, correct? Now, this nucleus is not stable. At any moment it can break up because its binding energy per nucleon is very unstable, uh, very less and uh, there is no stability inside the nucleus. So it breaks up into two elements. One is uh, uh, barium, 56 barium uh, 144 plus another one krypton. This is one example where it can happen so. 
the thing may not be the same in all the cases. All the uranium may not yield the same products. But one example I'll take. 36 krypton, uh, nine, uh, nine, 89 I'll put. And uh, uh, neutrons, some three neutrons are pro uh, produced. Okay, so better you remember this example because it may be asked in the exam. Give an example for fission. So take uranium-235, bombard it with the neutron. When neutron goes and hit, uh, uh, gets itself into the nucleus of uranium, you will get a new element, uranium-236, and barium plus krypton plus three neutrons, okay? Um, so is it balanced now? 236 here, 92 here, what about here? 144, uh, 153, and 233, plus three neutrons. So three neutrons, three into one, three. 236, what about this one? 56. Uh, uh, 62, 92, yes, 0, so 92, it is balanced. Now, if you observe this, large amount of energy is also released. Say, for example, almost 200 million electron volt of energy is released, say, if it is so. From where do we get that energy? This is another example for Einstein's mass energy relation, where energy is converted into mass. This is another example. How do you explain so? You calculate the mass of the reactants, get the mass of the products, then you, surprisingly you will find that the mass of barium, krypton and three neutrons is lesser than the mass of uranium and uh, uh, this neutron. Uranium and neutron together make more mass and uh, barium, krypton and uh, three neutrons make less mass. So there is a mass difference, mass defect. So if you are asked to find out mass defect, what you have to do is add the masses of all the uh, products, barium, krypton and three neutrons subtract it from the total mass of uh, uh, the reactants. You will get the mass defect, convert it into energy, you will get this one. Of course, we are going to work out problems on that base, right? Okay, so this is the energy obtained and that yields a large amount of energy. And remember, when a nuclear fission is taking place, whether it is in a, um, uh, a nuclear reactor or a nuclear bomb, controlled or uncontrolled, whatever it is, it is not the single nucleus which is uh, breaking into lighter nuclei. Because when you take the sample, you don't take the one single atom. It is very difficult to take one single atom. You take a sample of uranium. Suppose you take one kg of uranium. It contains so many atoms, right? It, it doesn't contain a single atom. So when so many atoms are taken together, when you hit one neutron to one nucleus randomly, and that neutron goes to that nucleus and it enters the nucleus and it creates instability and uh, that gives uh, uh, the products and a large amount of energy. Now, along with that energy and the uh, products, you see three neutrons are produced. I think you can see this, right? Yeah. Three neutrons are also produced. What do these three neutrons do? They don't keep, simply keep quiet. They are moving, fast moving neutrons. They hit three more uranium nuclei because you have taken a sample of uranium uh, where it is in grams or kgs and uh, it contains plenty and plenty of uh, um, uranium nuclei. For example, if you take 235 gram of uranium, it contains a greater number of molecules, correct? So uh, uh, now, uh, so the three neutrons released, they bring uh, uh, fission in three more uranium nuclei. And if those, uh, if I can write this one, you might have seen this uh, chain reaction process anywhere. So suppose this is uranium-235, one uranium through 235 atom in the uh, cluster of uh, uranium that you have taken, one neutron enters and hits this. It gives three neutrons, right? Three neutrons are released. What do these three neutrons they do? They, do they keep quiet? No, they will go and hit three more new uranium atoms, uranium, uranium, uranium. And here again, three more neutrons are released, like this. Now it is nine, nine neutrons in the three process. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you take the uh, highest possibilities, there will be nine neutrons. What, what these nine neutrons will do? They won't simply keep quiet. They keep on uh, uh, producing instability in uh, nine more uranium atoms because many many uranium atoms are available in the sample there is no scarcity of uranium atoms these nine fissions again they yield to 27 neutrons i need not explain it now it is like this is called chain reaction 
So, every time if you want to bring the chain reaction, you need not take a neutron one by one and hit uh, the neutrons. As you take mangoes from a tree, you have to hit each uh, mango with each stone. But here it need not be so, because each mango yields one more stone. So, the three more stones. And those three more stones will uh, uh, take up three, uh, nine uh, mangoes, so something like that. So, uh, fission process produces some fast moving neutrons and these neutrons hit a few more uh, uranium atoms and uh, uh, uranium nuclei and bring uh, uh, fission in them and uh, release three more in each that produces nine and then 27 then each three 27 into three uh, like 81 so like this way it keeps on growing and this is an uncontrolled process finally remember each process gives this much of energy when this happens within a fraction of a second large amount of energy is released and that is called uncontrolled chain reaction so chain reaction is a process where neutrons produced in one fission reaction and they uh, continue the chain reaction by hitting themselves to few more neutrons and thereby producing many, many neutrons. So it is a self-growing uh, chain reaction and it is called uncontrolled chain reaction. And if you want to control the chain reaction, what you have to do is you have to control the neutrons. You should stop the neutrons which are bringing further chain reaction. That is the only way of controlling this one. So fission reaction, fission chain reaction is a process with where fission chain reaction <coughs> fission chain reaction is a process where neutrons produced in one fission process will bring uh, um, fission in uh, another uh, uh, neutron nu uh, sorry uranium nucleus and makes the new uh, chain reaction to uh, sorry makes the fission reaction to grow and thereby releasing large amount of energy in a fraction of time this is the process involved in nuclear bomb we use fission for constructive as well as destructive purpose also if it is a bomb it's uncontrolled chain reaction. What, about, what do we do in uh, uh, nuclear reactors where it shouldn't explode, it shouldn't give energy all of a sudden, and that energy, same amount of energy, should be continued for a long length of time. It, if, we, if the energy is released like a bomb all of a sudden, how to make use of it? It creates destruction. And if you can take that energy little by little for a long length of time, it is constructive. You can use it for a long time, and it will not be destructive then. So how to do that? In order to do it, you have to control the number of neutrons. And nuclear reactors employ control chain reaction. They use control chain reaction. How? By absorbing neutrons. And uh, we have all the arrangements in the nuclear reactors. And you, have, you might have studied that diagram and all. I don't go for that nuclear reactor uh, completely. They have control rods. What are control rods? Control rods are the rods which are introduced and taken away from the nuclear reactor core. Right? In a nuclear reactor, there is the central part of the nuclear reactor where chain reaction is uh, 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 taking place. And if, I, if you want me to explain it uh, in short, there is S and I will symbolically, I will show it. This is the core. And it is made up of concrete walls. These are all concrete walls. Because when a nuclear chain reaction takes place, there are uh, so many problems. The products obtained, what I have written, for example, barium and krypton. Those products are highly radioactive. What do you mean by radioactive? They emit harmful radiations like alpha, beta, and gamma radiations. Gamma radiations are very, very hazardous, and they create so many problems. And uh, they are also creating some genetic problems. So problems will be carried to the offsprings and the later generations. And that's why the people working in the uh, nuclear reactor must be protected from all those things. So the whole chain reaction, control chain reaction, is occurring within a concrete wall. And there are some control rods here. And of course, all these are controlled and introduced inside and taken outside using all mechanical and uh, um, computer processes and no people will be involved in this. What are control rods? Control rods are one which can absorb neutrons. And if the chain reaction is going out of control, that means beyond the process, these control rods are put in, neutrons are absorbed, so that uh, chain reaction is controlled. Because if you go, for example, in each chain reaction, for example, one neutron hits one nucleus, say, it brings uh, three more uh, uh, chain reactions, uh, sorry, fission process. And those three more fission processes uh, produce three neutrons each, so you will have nine neutrons coming out. And if that nine neutrons, again, they bring uh, uh, fission in nine more nuclei, 27 neutrons are produced. Out of 27, absorb 18 neutrons, you will have nine only now, active. Again, those nine neutrons go and hit uh, to nine more uh, uranium nuclei, 
27 neutrons are produced. Again, absorb 18 neutrons. So you can control the chain reaction and sustained chain reaction can take place. What do you mean by sustained? The energy is distributed in a um, uniform way and uh, uh, that is not exploded and the chain reaction will not uh, uh, explode or it will not uh, grow like uh, multiples of 3 or multiples of 2. So it will be controlled and that is what is done in control rush and that control chain reaction yields a lot amount of energy and there will be, will be energy in the form of heat also and there will be uh, some uh, um, coolants right what are coolants heavy water or uh, uh, some uh, liquid will be uh, circulated inside and when it passes through the core and comes out it gets heated and it gets converted into steam and the pressure created by the steam is used to run the turbine and we use it for electricity and any other constructive purpose of course, you should have a coolant and there are some uh, materials used inside called moderators. What are moderators? Moderators are the elements or the uh, parts used in the nuclear reactor to slow down the fast neutrons. Because for most of the uh, nuclear reactors, we depend on uranium. Uranium is the uh, um, uh, easily available uh, raw material for fission but not uranium-235. Uranium-235 is uh, um, not, um, uh, not available in abundance. But uranium-235, uh, sorry, 238, it is an isotope of uh, uranium, it is abundantly available. But unfortunately, this doesn't uh, um, undergo fission for uh, fast neutrons. What do you mean by fast neutrons and uh, slow neutrons? Neutrons having some energy, um, uh, certain amount of energy are called slow neutrons and beyond that we call, uh, beyond certain amount of energy we call it as fast neutrons. Now neutrons released during one fission of uranium, they are very fast neutrons. But uranium 238, if this is the raw material used here, what happens is, if fast neutrons go and hit the uranium 238 nucleus, they come out of it and they don't produce any fission. Suppose, for example, if you want to hit a bullet inside a ball, cricket ball or a, or a tennis ball, say, you have to hit the bullet into the tennis ball with a proper speed. If the speed is more than the required one, the bullet will come out of the other side, right? You, I think it is a very easy example you can understand. So if the speed is more than a certain critical value, the bullet will come from the other side. If you want the bullet to be hidden inside the, um, uh, that uh, tennis ball, you have to hit it with a certain range of velocities. Similarly, if fission has to occur in uranium-238 nuclei in the some other atoms, the speed of the neutron which is hitting it should be of proper value and it should have certain kinetic energy. If the energy is too high, if the speed is too high, if they are fast neutrons, they don't bring about uh, any fission in the other uranium nuclei. They simply escape away. They don't uh, keep themselves inside the nucleus. Unstability is not continued. So, in order to make them to produce fission in few more uranium atoms, they must be slowed down. If they are, allow if they are allowed as it is, if they are very fast neutrons, they don't bring about uh, fission in the other uranium atoms. They must be slowed down. How to slow down them? Moderators. Moderators slow down the fast neutrons. So, a nuclear reactor if it is using uranium, it must have a moderator. Moderators slow down the fast neutrons, control rods absorb the neutrons, thereby control the number of neutrons, they are not controlling the speed of the neutrons. They control the number of neutrons released and they will control the chain reaction. They won't allow the chain reaction to grow beyond a certain limit. Uh, these absorbing control rods, whereas moderators slow down the fast neutrons and thereby they facilitate the further chain reaction. So, a chain reaction can uh, grow up and uh, end up with the explosion, releasing energy in a large amount in a short time, like nuclear bomb. Uh, a, a nuclear uh, fission chain reaction can be controlled by controlling the number of neutrons. Sometimes the nuclear chain reaction may, be, uh, may, may not occur and because the neutrons released in the, uh, that uh, sample may escape away. More number of neutrons will be escaping, less number of neutrons will be remaining in the sample. That doesn't bring a further chain reaction and the chain reaction may stop. That is also possible. If the number of neutrons produced are less and the number of neutrons uh, um, escaping are more, then the chain reaction will be uh, stopping in the further uh, uh, process. So in, uh, in order to define it, whether the chain reaction is growing, 
or whether it is sustained, whether it is decreasing, we have a, 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 a factor called multiplication factor. What do you mean by multiplication factor? K. It is a ratio. Multiplication factor K is defined as the ratio of number of neutrons produced number of neutrons produced in present generation I will number of neutrons produced in present generation present generation means when you look into the fission process at this moment how many neutrons are produced if it is more than the preceding generation that means previous generation then it is growing right if you have scored more marks than the previous one you are improving that's what we say so if the number of neutrons produced in present generation is uh, it is a ratio of number of neutrons produced in the present generation to the number of neutrons produced in preceding generation this is the definition for multiplication factor So multiplication factor in a chain reaction is defined as the ratio of number of neutrons produced in the present generation, whatever you are observing now, to the number of neutrons produced in the preceding generation. That ratio is called multiplication factor. And if multiplication factor is uh, equal to 1, what do you mean by that? Then the number of neutrons produced in the present generation and preceding generation are same. That means you are controlling the extra neutrons which are produced. In every chain, uh, chain reaction, uh, you are controlling the extra neutrons and thereby maintaining the number of neut uh, neutrons same. That is a control chain reaction. For control chain reaction, K is 1. And if K is greater than 1, what do you mean by that? The chain reaction is uncontrolled because the number of numerator should be greater denominator should be lesser number of neutrons produced in the preceding generation is less present generation is more that means it is growing growing chain reaction and it is uncontrolled so if k is less than one what is what do you mean by k is less than one if the multiplication factor is less than one then the number of neutrons produced in the present generation will be less and you are scoring less mark in the final exam and more marks in the previous exams your performance is getting poorer and poorer so that is a, uh, a chain reaction which is going to be stopped a chain reaction which will go which will end up uh, finally end up uh, not in explosion with uh, no energy released so uh, finally it will stop so it is a chain reaction will stop so this is uh, the next uh, process okay so in uh, uh, nuclear reactors what the people will do the engineers and the scientists the core what i have drawn that concrete uh, place and uh, where the chain reaction is taking place where we take the raw material like uranium and uh, uh, thorium and those things when uh, that uh, material is taken the size of the core where we put the raw material size of the core should be uh, a, of a certain value called critical size of course this is not in the syllabus what do you mean by critical size the size of the uh, core of the uh, nuclear reactor. If the size of the material taken is too small, what happens is neutrons will be produced, but they will escape from the material. More number of neutrons will escape and less number of neutrons will remain inside the material and the chain reaction will not grow. It's, uh, instead, it will stop. If the size of the material will be, if it is taken is uh, material in the sense raw material like uranium, if, if it is taken in a large amount, more than the critical size, then what happens is all the neutrons will remain inside and that will uh, create more and more number of uh, uh, fission reactions and it will become control uncontrolled and if the amo amount of material taken is of critical size only if you take what is required for uh, a control chain reaction what you call critical size critical size is the uh, minimum size or it is the exact size uh, for which controlled re chain reaction to take place 
that means in a critical if you take the sample in a critical size what happens is number of neutrons produced in the present uh, generation and number of neutrons lost uh, will be balanced and the chain reaction will be continued as I have given in an example when 27 neutrons are produced suppose 18 escape from the material the 9 will remain those 9 will again produce 27 neutrons 18 will escape so critical size is the minimum size required for uh, control chain reaction okay so the core of the nuclear reactor is always of critical size so that is multiplication factor k this is always taken into account in a uh, chain reaction so uh, in uh, uh, control chain reaction we use uh, control chain reaction is used in nuclear reactors and in nuclear bomb uncontrolled chain reaction is taking place um, and uh, okay so that is a uh, one right i will give you an each, a little bit of introduction to fusion and then i'll stop okay yes little bit theoretical not, not uh, much and also you have come to know about all these things in the rover classes and even if you can understand it if you read it uh, yourself there is no much uh, uh, some techniques involved in this just like a story okay what is fusion fusion is a process where two lighter nuclei combine together to form a heavier nucleus best example is 1 H1 two hydrogen nuclei this is what is happening in stars you sun is giving so much of energy from billions of years and uh, still giving energy and it will continue for so many billions of years from where that raw material and what is burning there how do we get so much of energy from the sun it is the fusion process occurring in the stars and sun even including sun what type of fusion raw material sir do we have so much of raw material in the sun yes hydrogen is available in plenty in stars because stars themselves are uh, formed, the, a new star will be born only when the hydrogen cloud come together, right? And uh, from there it starts, the birth of a star. When hydrogen uh, gas come, or clouds come together, the, um, um, that uh, uh, birth of a star takes place. So hydrogen is available in stars in plenty. So what is there uh, to think about the raw material? Plenty of hydrogen is available. And these hydrogen and hydrogen, because of gravitational force, and they come closer, they collapse, and temperature increases, they fuse together. And that, and remember, if two hydrogen nuclei have to come together, they are positively charged. It is not so easy to fuse two nuclei together. And if two hydrogen nuclei have to be uh, accelerated to a very high kinetic energy, and if they have to fuse together to form a deuterium nuclear, say, 1 H2, again another isotope of hydrogen, high kinetic energy must be given for them and that is possible only when the temperature is very high and the, such a high kinetic energy is possessed by two nuclei only at high temperature. So for fusion to occur you need high temperature. Sir, whether that high temperature is available in uh, stars, definitely because when the hydrogen clouds come together, close together, temperature increases and that temperature is suitable for uh, this uh, fusion reactor reaction to take place but from where do we get energy okay fusion reaction is occurring some amount of mass again is converted into energy so this yields to um, uh, hydrogen uh, gives rise to deuterium plus some amount of energy in between you will find that there are some more particles emitted. One is positron. What is positron? It is the antiparticle of electron. What do you mean by antiparticle? The particle which has got the same mass but opposite charge. And there are some, some more conditions for antiparticles. If a particle has to be an antiparticle of another, there are so many conditions. But for the time being, see, proton is not the antiparticle of electron. Positron is the antiparticle of electron. It has the same mass and opposite charge. For the time being, it is enough. Since a, a positron has the same charge but opposite uh, in nature and same mass, now we can call it as an antiparticle. Such a positron is emitted, very similar to electron but positive charge. So deuterium plus positron plus another particle called neutrino. So nu, okay, this is neutrino and this is positron and this is some about 0.42 million electron volt of energy as I remember 0.4 something 0.4 million electron of volt and I will check it later so this is positron and this is neutrino 
so these particles are also emitted we will come to uh, we will come to these particles sir from where do we get all these particles and how do you how do the scientists came to know that these particles are emitted because they balance the equation and if hydrogen has got some energy this hydrogen has got some energy when they join whether the energy of this uh, uh, deuterium is and the positron is same as this energy and if you add all these three energy some energy is missing and some particles should be coming out that's how the, this uh, neutrino was detected so there are some uh, conditions for the equations to be satisfied when it is not satisfied they search for some other thing so they come to know that one more particle is emitted one more uh, balancing uh, suppose you want balance the charge one more particle has to be emitted something like that okay for the time being you take this as a nuclear reaction uh, that is fusion reaction so fusion is a process where two lighter nuclei combine together to form a heavier nucleus when they form the heavier nucleus large amount of energy so sorry certain amount of energy is released okay um, now they become stable of course uh, deuterium is also not completely stable in stars what happens is once hydrogen and hydrogen combine together to form uh, deuterium then deuterium and deuterium will combine together to form helium 1h2 plus 1h2 will give you 2he4 balanced again so they will give helium and helium will combine together to form carbon oxygen and uh, finally it will end up with iron so this is happening in stars but uh, st stars will give continuous amount of energy and uh, if you read the birth of a star and the death of a star death will uh, occur up, uh, for a star in different uh, ways maybe in the form of a black hole or maybe in the form of a uh, supernova explosion and uh, you can uh, study it later but the main thing here you have to remember is it is the fusion reaction which is taking place in the stars for the production of so much amount of energy and uh, raw material available for uh, the fusion reaction is abundantly available in uh, stars and another thing is uh, high temperature available for the fusion reaction and that condition is not required for fission in fission fission can occur uh, even uh, it, it doesn't require any high temperature but fusion requires high temperature fission doesn't require high temperature that's why fusion is also called thermonuclear reaction maybe a question also why fusion is called thermonuclear reaction if two nuclei have to come closer with high kinetic energy and join together fuse together high temperature is required in the surroundings and that is why thermo, uh, fusion reaction is called uh, uh, thermonuclear reaction because high temperature is required so if you have fusion bomb uh, there are two types of bomb fission bomb and fusion bomb if you want to have fusion bomb you must go for fission also first you have to, you have to create fission and develop a high temperature then you have to go for fusion but one advantage with the only fusion is the products obtained like deuterium helium carbon they are all not radioactive whereas the products obtained in uh, fission reaction they are highly radioactive that's why people oppose nuclear bombs fission bombs because once the bomb is exploded large amount of light heat sound energy is released people will die that's gone okay what about the second part the remaining people can't go there because it is uh, full of uh, harmful radiations and those who go get affected with harmful radiations they are also affected and people who live there will be affected and their next generation will also be affected because those radiations ca they cause genetic mutation and they will cause a, a problem in the cells and which will be carried to the F offsprings next generation so that is uh, harmful not only to the people who are now living and also to the people who are going to uh, give birth uh, or who are going to be born in the later stages also they will also be affected so that is why it is a most dangerous one but that is nuclear fission bomb whereas uh, in fusion process the raw materials uh, the sorry the products obtained are not radioactive even in nuclear reactors when a nuclear reactor uh, unit is open in a certain place people uh, 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 they oppose it they protest it because the byproducts obtained after uh, carrying all the process that shouldn't be uh, thrown away outside it is most dangerous if it is put in a river if it is put into the sea then all the uh, the living beings in the sea like fish or anything they get affected and if we, we eat it we also get affected so it is there are some particular international rules the way in which these byproduct not in these byproducts the uh, uh, the products obtained in the nuclear fission in a nuclear reactor obtained they must be put in a deep ground buried in concrete tanks right concrete tanks must be built up they must be put in the deep ground and even in the place where there are no habitants 
and no people are living. So in such a, there are some uh, conditions. And uh, in some places, we don't know whether the people are following it or not. So that's why people protested uh, to have nuclear reactors in their place. Okay, but we need energy. Uh, we need electrical energy every, everywhere, but we don't want uh, nuclear uh, reactors. Okay, that is a problem now. Okay, so we, I will carry on with this one in the next class. Thanks for watching my class, class because already it is time and hope you are uh, uh, using these classes very well and uh, even though it is uh, and uh, one more thing you will have a few other classes physics uh, other than physics chemistry maths will run within four days within four days you will have regular classes uh, right in uh, uh, other subjects also so we are making all the arrangements for it. Uh, with so many difficulties we are doing it but still we are with you so don't waste these classes use it as much as possible thanks for watching my class take care of your health that is more important so we will meet in the next class thank you